Hello, my name's John and I head up uh, Lighthouse, which is a Christian community for those battered and bruised by the storms of life. Now, Lighthouse 2020 has contained many joyful moments full of laughter and love with the presence and the peace of Jesus. But we now journey through the bleak midwinter of COVID-related fear, lockdown and isolation. We long and we yearn for a COVID-free world of community, hugs and intimacy without the need for face masks and social distancing. And the Lighthouse community are not alone in feeling this way. And perhaps each of us feel deep within us a sense that this world as it stands is not the way that it is meant to be. In this liminal space of disorientation, we simultaneously look back to happier times, but all we also look forward to a time when our current situation will be in the past. I'm reminded of three words, one Welsh, one German, and one from within the church that resonate with these feelings. Number one, the Welsh have a word, hiraf, which has to do with a feeling of homesickness, which we feel within us for a world that we cannot return to and for a world that never was, hiraf. Number two, the Germans have the word Zenzucht, which refers to a longing, a pining, a yearning for something that is intensely missing, Zenzucht. We are east of Eden, homesick exiles, wandering through a beautiful but broken world. Number three, in its liturgical calendar, the church observes in the four weeks leading up to Christmas, the season of Advent. In Advent, we look back and celebrate the first coming of Jesus in his glorious incarnation. And we also look forward to his glorious return, the resurrection of the dead and the new creation. At this future Advent, pain will be no more. There will be no more death, no more virus, and no longer will there, there be a sense of hiraf, of homesickness, or zenzucht, a longing for something intensely missing. For we will be with our Saviour and King face to face. Would you join me in, these, in this prayer? Hiraf, Lord have mercy. Zenzucht, Christ have mercy. Advent, let your kingdom come. And so today we're beginning a new Advent series and over the next few weeks we'll, we will see how the Old Testament offers the believer a hope promised. And this hope is inaugurated and embodied in the first advent of Jesus and actualized and consummated in his return. Now this talk, sounding like a heavy rock band from the 90s, 1980s, takes the name Skull Crusher. So fasten your seatbelts as we look at how the Old Testament describes the world as a war zone and offers signposts to a world in which evil is defeated and crushed. In the opening pages of the Bible, in the metaphorical and mythical world of Genesis 1 to 3, we find deep truths that resonate deep within us. God creates a good world, a bobby dazzler of a world in which humanity lives in sweet communion with its creator and with each other and the rest of creation. Eden, like all human life, is a gift full of possibility and potentiality, a tangible world of creativity and human flourishing in which physicality and spirituality are unified, a world of shalom. Heaven 
touching earth, a world with no concept of Hirif or Zenzucht. Yet Genesis 1 and 2 give way to Genesis 3 and humanity finds itself east of Eden. According to the biblical text, this is for a couple of reasons. Firstly, humanity fails to live up to its calling. Adam and Eve representing each and every one of us. They mess up and they rebel against creator God. As the prophet spoke, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. As the Apostle Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We too, like Adam and Eve, often bring misery to our lives through proactive sin and rebellion. Alexander Solonitsu, who was imprisoned in gulags in communist Russia, was right when he said these words, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. Or as Oswald J. Smith noted, the heart of the problem is the problem of the human part heart. Secondly, Genesis 3 also points the finger in a deeper and darker direction as malevolent forces of chaos which have interrupted God's good creation, which tempt and coerce human beings so that human beings are not only proactive agents in their own sin, but that they're also victims caught up in the crossfire of a cosmic conflict. Scripture says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must eat from any tree, not eat from any tree in the garden? The serpent. In the Bible, these dehumanizing forces which oppose the rule and the reign of Yahweh are often portrayed as snakes, cosmic monsters, beasts and dragons. But also at times they take on the name of, of Satan, the demonic, of powers and principalities. The snake, the serpent in Genesis 3, like the beast in Daniel's visions and the dragon in the book of Revelation, he comes to steal hope, kill joy and destroy peace. Or picking up language from the New Testament, Satan is the father of lies who comes as a roaring lion to seek who he may devour. And we also have heard his roar. We have all been dealt cards not of our own choosing. We all, like Adam and Eve, are wounded because we have been caught up in the crossfire of a cosmic conflict. Although the Bible talks about evil attacking individuals, the church has always also maintained that these spiritual forces can become endemic within populations through worldviews, ideas and cultural forces. You see, we in our own times, with COVID-19, climate breakdown and international politics, we see how the unseen powers of consumerism, individualism and unrestrained capitalism destroy creation. They can cause human beings, corporations and even nations to act in ways which are counter to human flourishing. And we join, don't we, with creation in groaning and longing and saying, how long, O oh Lord, Hiraf, Zenzucht, homesick exiles longing to escape this war zone of human experience. But the Genesis account 
as well as offering us a sobering myth which matches our own realities, also provides a hope that one day these beastly forces will be defeated. Notice what happens in Genesis 3. God brings judgment against human rebellion and against the snake. God is not indifferent to human rebellion, nor is he indifferent to the chaotic monsters and unseen forces which challenge Shalom and the sanctity of Eden. Yet in this passage, we also see that God does not destroy Adam and Eve. In fact, when they find themselves naked, he clothes them. Furthermore, when God speaks to the snake, we learn about both the ongoing conflict and the defeat of evil. Let me read to you Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, skull, and you will strike his heel. Hence the title, Skull Crusher. God tells the snake that he will be biting at the heels of humanity and that there will be enmity between humanity and this chaotic beast. The struggle with evil is not just historic, but present and sometimes personal, and we know this all so well. However, God continues and speaks of a time when a descendant of Eve Note the singular language, he will crush your skull. A descendant of Eve shall bruise and crush and smash the head of the snake. In other words, from the realm of humanity, one will come who will crush the forces of chaos and the enemies of Yahweh. And so the story of the Old Testament moves forward as a story in search of an ending in which a skull crusher will arise to wage a definitive and decisive war on evil. We see glimpses of this in the book of Exodus and the defeat of the Egyptians and the liberation of God's people. By the way, at Pharaoh saw himself as the incarnation of the sun god Amun-Re and he even had a snake as the centrepiece of his headdress. But with a strong and mighty hand, the dehumanising Egyptian empire was brought low. We see glimpses of this in the historical books with the conquest of Canaan and even the story of David and Goliath whereby David, empowered by the Spirit, deals a death blow to the giant Goliath and even cuts off his head. We see glimpses of this in the Psalms, where the psalmists long for a time when evil will be defeated and skulls will be crushed. As the Psalms say, they are like hungry lions, eager to tear me apart, like young lions hiding in ambush. Arise, O Lord, arise, O Lord, stand against them and bring them to their knees. Rescue me from the wicked with your sword. We see glimpses of this in Isaiah where the prophet foresees a day when the serpent of old will be destroyed. Isaiah 27 verse 1 reads, In that day the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. We all, don't we, at times want a skull crushing Messiah to come and clean up this wicked world. A violent Messiah who would act like a holy Jack Bauer, a righteous Rambo, or a lion of Judah who would come and slay the beasts and the serpents which lurk in Eden. But the biblical story and the story of the world reaches its unpredictable climax in the person of Jesus. He really does come to defeat evil, but 
not in the way that one expects. Jesus defeats evil, not through violence or crushing physical skulls, but by self-giving, sacrificial love. Jesus defeats the monsters of violence and deceit, not by being violent, but through the way of crucified love in which Jesus would rather have his own body crushed than slay his enemies. Jesus, as the very embodiment of love and extravagant mercy, he unleashes a power which is far greater than the forces of chaos and evil. What does it look like when God flexes his muscles in the face of evil? Well, it looks like this. It looks like Jesus with arms outstretched and dying on a cross. In going the way of the cross, evil is seen for what it really is. As Colossians 2 verses 13 to 15 say, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You see, the death of Jesus acts like a cosmic magnet, drawing all evil onto himself. Human evil, political evil, religious evil, spiritual evil, guided and encouraged and shaped by the power of sin, Satan, serpents, powers and principalities. Jesus on the cross is caught up in the crossfire of a cosmic conflict and dies a victim of these beastly forces. And then, and then, and then in his death and burial, he storms the gates of hell and in his resurrection, he shows that there is a force greater than evil, that love itself wins. He has done this in his first advent, incarnation, crucifixion and resurrection. He has dealt the death blow to the accuser, the serpent of old. And although the battle still rages, victory is now assured. In the book of Revelation, we find a similar hope, or this, although this time in apocalyptic uh, technicolor. Empires and dragons bring carnage to the world, but still the kingdom of the butchered lamb will prevail until that day when all tears will be wiped away. And so we wait as Advent people with Hiraf and Zenzukt homesick exiles, longing for justice, longing for the final eradication of evil and for the world to be set to rights. We wait as Advent people, working, living, playing and praying, let your kingdom come. We're called to live as outposts to the peaceable skull crusher and as a signpost to the coming age. Let me end this talk with some of the final words from the book of Romans. And here the Apostle Paul, he looks back to the mythical promise of Genesis 3, but he also looks forward to what will be. His hope is steadfast when he says these words, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.